uh, everybody, what an honor and pleasure to have Alex Walchek with us next for this super special March edition Living Histories back-to-back um, -back series. Um, Alex, without further ado, tell us about Never Saying Never and Living Histories. Okay, well, thanks for the invitation. So um, yeah, that's going to be the guiding theme of my talk. Uh, basically showing, I mean, the question I got asked is how did I end up here? And what was my path and what shaped my path? And the answer is sort of there was no path. So let me just sort of tell you, I was born in a city in Northwest Poland, and I share the same birthplace with Catherine the Great, who you've probably heard of. And Donia von Borg, who is one of the world's famous witches, and she didn't end too well, but in the meantime, she did manage to do quite a few things. And uh, from then, I went a, quite a bit around the Northern Hemisphere, hitting San Diego, which of course is only famous for Top Gun, going to another place in California, then Princeton, and ending up in Paris. So. How did that happen? Well, as I said, the question was about the path and it's not a path really, it's a random walk. And actually the geographical location is probably the simplest one. Uh, so I also know half of you are watching it to see pictures of me as a kid. So I will provide that. Uh, and so what was the plan? I've always had a plan. Uh, so as a kid, my plan when I grow up was to live in London, be a history professor and have a cat. Okay, all of these were pretty simple. I lived in London, my mom had studied history and I had a cat, but I failed on all of these accounts. And I think that's a general theme of this talk that whenever I had a plan, it never went according to plan. So instead of all this, I ended up with Paris, physics, and the greatest failure, no cat. So if there's one thing I really want to say is it's good to have plans, but then be open-minded about what you actually, what happens to you and how, you know, be open to whatever can happen to you. So of course, in the meantime, uh, I had, as I grew older, I had other ideas and they were all quite basic. So I wanted to be a lawyer, which given that my dad um, was a seaman, this turned into the idea of being an international maritime lawyer, which is basically what all my summer holidays prepared me for. And uh, the idea is I would be basically writing conventions on how to fight pirates. And given where I was coming from, this was not a ridiculous idea. It was quite a straightforward path. But it was also part of my teenage years and that's part of rebelling against everything your parents do. So of course I didn't like this idea. I didn't like my mom's job. I didn't like anything to do with Astro because that's my aspiration so that unfortunately and that is a regret I have I had a very dumb teenager bias against everything to do with the sky and I could easily eliminate all careers links with the arts because I had no actual talent and was very aware of that then of course as I said it's all very obvious I wanted to be a journalist and I spent most of my high school years devoting myself to various humanities and I ended up having bad experiences when it got to sort of meeting university professors um, and figuring out that you have to learn a lot of stuff off by heart which I wasn't very good at. The other thing I did is learn German which given that I ended up in France was also a mistake because I never learned French. So as you can see, every time there was a choice, I sort of made the not obvious choice. However, German led me to spend a lot of time in Berlin and that will come back later. So how did I end up in physics? Well, honestly, probably out of spite uh, because people said I couldn't because I shouldn't. On, so for the completely 
wrong ideas and reasons. So first thing to point out, and I think this is not only me, but it's shared by other people, I had absolutely no idea what physics really was because high school physics has nothing to do with either university physics or with real research. So I had no idea at the age, age 18, I had to pick a subject I will study for the next five years. I picked physics. It was a completely random choice based on complete misinformation. But I do have some things to say about high school. First of all, I owe a great thanks to my physics teacher, whose main job was that she didn't make me hate physics. I didn't especially like it. I had nothing against it, but I know so many, many people who end up hating physics that I realized that with time, I really, I, I, I have her to thank for that. On the other hand, I had very good biology and chemistry, and I actually, that gave me a taste for what contemporary science is like, because we learned about the lag operon, we learned about actual implementation of Hamiltonians and quantum systems. Uh, so I had this idea, but I didn't really have an idea about physics. Um, so, whoops, okay, now it's not working. So choosing physics, I also knew I would learn something new. And I had a plan, as I said, I always had plans. So my plan was that I wanted to be a director of photography. I wanted to go into film and I want to learn how to sort of, you know, direct the camera, all that. Again, it wasn't a completely ridiculous idea. The physics department I was going to has produced a lot of film people in film. So it sort of made sense. Uh, but again, I didn't have the heart to tell my parents that I want to go to film school. So physics seemed like a good intermediate. I was also very conscious that, you know, nobody really makes it in film. So I had many plan Bs that, you know, physics could be useful. For. So basically it seemed like a good idea and in I went. Now, the pro problem was that having spent all this time doing humanities, I was completely um, so my plan of learning something new was correct, only I, you know, I really did learn a lot of new things. So I found myself in the physics department, where I was essentially the only person who hadn't taken part in the physics Olympiad or hadn't come from one of the two high schools that spent the last four years preparing these kids to study in this department. And so I had this vision of university life as an intellectually pleasing endeavor where you talk to your peers and get intellectually challenged. Instead, I found basically my all my Saturdays were taken up with nonstop tests. And I, you know, I really didn't know what I was doing there. So year one, essentially, I survived with a small trip to the philosophy department just to make sure that if I fail the year, they'll take me in. And year two and three, I started liking it. And I started liking it through formalism. And I will admit to that. And this is another evolution in my life that I, you know, it takes time to open up to some things. Year two and three, I also was exposed for the first time to biophysics. And that kind of blew my mind. I really liked that. But I wanted to go into medical physics, which is more sort of neuroscience. But for a completely random event, for talking to one PhD student, she told me, do molecular biophysics. It's just a better thing to do. So I did. And year four, I discovered StatMec. And that was my really moment of falling in love with physics. At the same time, remember how I spent my summers in Berlin? A guy who I met there was a PhD student at Caltech and gave me the idea of doing a summer research uh, project, which I ended up doing in UCSD in a biophysics group, in a molecular biophysics group. And so I went back after a year, while at UCSD, I applied for grad school at UCSD. I went back I, to Poland. I did my master thesis. Uh, I did uh, where I also did a lot of labs in physics, in, in biology and chemistry, and I learned a lot of biology and chemistry. And then off I was to uh, UCSD. But essentially, I wouldn't have ended up there had I not gone to Berlin, had I not talked to this random grad student, and had I not made a really weird choice to study something I knew nothing about. 
So the rest is sort of straightforward. I was a grad student at UCSD. There were, of course, a few changes of plans. I did my PhD with Peter Wallenus, who I thought mainly worked on proteins, which is completely not true. So I ended up not working on proteins, for which I was very happy. Uh, nothing against proteins. Uh, and this time I was very, I was prepared. I was well prepared and I still learned a lot. And I think I learned a lot scientifically. I mean, I learned a lot of physics. I learned a lot in so many dimensions. And it's thanks to all of these people who were my professors, who were my mentors, and to whom I uh, owe really a change of plan. They're the ones who told me to look at reality to think about reality and to not be obsessed about formalisms. And uh, thanks to, I also went to a lot of summer and winter schools and I also learned to be very critical about my own research. In fact, so critical that after a few years I had enough of biophysics and I just wanted a Hamiltonian to the diagonalize like all my friends in condensed matter and not worry about what it really means and why are we doing this model? I just wanted, you know, they have models, they have the Hubbard model. Why can't we do the same? So I did that for a while. That was a bit of random walking again until I met these two people as a, a grad fellow at KATP and who again sort of steered me into biophysics. Again, made me realize I really know nothing about anything and there's a lot to learn. And so I set out to learning that in biophysics. And then I ended up with a postdoc in Princeton, which also was not part of the direct plan. So in Princeton, again, I learned a lot. And here, one of the things I really learned was to open up to data. And so it's thanks to these three people. And so before that, I remember I'm really coming from very formal, my first love in physics was formalism. Then I understood you have to deal with reality. And then only then was I prepared for data. And also in Princeton is really where I asked, learned to ask questions. But the other thing I learned is that science is just more fun if you do it with friends. So these, this is just a choice of people who were in my scientific life while I was at Princeton and who are also very good friends and with whom I have continued to have great science with. And this is somebody who comes from, you see, my time at, at the end at UCSD. And he's the first person who told me that you can work on whatever you want as long as the company is good. And I think that's true. So last question of why did I start doing, working on uh, immune systems? So of course, physicists don't work on immune systems. And this started with a dinner in Princeton where a big shot professor asked me the question I really, really hate, which is what are you thinking about? Now, the honest answer, I was thinking about food and what I should choose from this menu I was staring at, but I knew I needed to start and I couldn't just answer the truth. So I was trying to appear to be smart. I thought back to the conversations I was having with another postdoc at the time who was trying to convince me to work on the immune system. And I was trying to convince her that it's a really bad idea for physicists to work on the immune system. So I'd been learning a lot through her about the immune system. So I said, the immune system. And then the big shelf professor said, me too. And so through this completely random event, I plunged into the immune system because this person gave me data and I never looked back. So I ended up in Paris. Uh, I won't tell you that much about it. They made, they essentially made the TV series out of it. So it's all true. Uh, you know, the ENS physics department is right here. And as you can imagine, my life in Paris is completely like glamorous with parties, cafes, and other wonderful experiences. This, just like depicted in the TV series with the occasional sort of fighting of windmills. So that's where I am like right now, and that's it. Thank you so much, Alex. On behalf of the audience, I'm clapping. Uh, everybody, please feel free to unmute and ask your questions.
Anybody? All right. I have, I have a, a burning question. What is what is preventing you from getting a cat? <laughs> I travel too much. Thanks. Um, Pansy, you have your hand raised. Go for it. Hi, Alex. Um, I did uh, meet you at CU Boulder Summer School, and my question is, what summer school or winter school did you do as a graduate student? So the first one I did was in Jerusalem. It was a winter school in Jerusalem. Uh, and I think one of the important things is coming from a place like UCSD. I met a lot of people from the so-called fancier schools, and I realized they're human beings. You know, as students in UCSD, we were all often taught that, well, you know, people at other schools would do pro solve this problem much more quickly. And I met them and, you know, I mean, sure, but they, you know, they were still human. Uh, and so the first one was Jerusalem. Then in Leuven, which is a statistical physics school, uh, Lazouche, and then Boulder. And then I've run a bunch of these since then. <laughs> uh, anybody else? Now's your moment. All right. Well, on that note, thank you again so much, Alex, for this wonderfully engaging and inspiring talk. Everybody, please clap. And I'm cl closing the recording on that note.